dato sì, mio signore. Wow, so what we've just been hearing is, uh, of course, a bunch of tunes from uh, Rachel Taylor Brown, and the last couple we just heard were uh, 17-Year Cicada, uh, Getcher, and God, and uh, her, her new record is absolutely lovely and uh, haunting and all the things you might expect from Rachel Taylor Brown, and even more diverse than previous outings. And we're lucky enough to have Rachel on the phone with us right now. Rachel, how are you? I'm good. That's so nice of you to say. Thank you. Well, you've done some <clears throat> some very uh, beautiful work that we've played here before. And uh, on this one, um, it's it's more of of the above and it's 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 more intense and it's more spacey and uh, more dynamic <laughs> and i don't know if you feel that did you did you did you feel that on this on this uh on this recording that you uh really hit a, a nice high mark well thank you first of all for saying that you can't i can't even tell you how nice it is to hear that um I don't think I do have an awareness. I mean, I'm, I aspire, as anyone probably is making anything, to improve as I go along, and you hope that the next one's better than the last one, but you, never, you just never know. And um, I like the album, yeah, it, it, and that always goes a long way with me once I put it out because then that sort of weather, it helps me weather it's, anybody happens to hate it, which is always going to happen. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I have that. I guess it's my dour Norwegian roots or something where, I mean, which go way back in my history, but I always expect the worst and then I'm happily surprised if, it, if something good happens. So <laughs> Start off negative. So any positive is good. That's, that's a good, uh, good philosophy. <laughs> no, it's very self-protective. <laughs> Probably cowardly in the long run, but, you know. <laughs> um, so, uh, for the, so this is the first time you're, you're on this particular show. I'm always excited to have a guest for the first time. And uh, we've been listening to your stuff for a while on the show. And uh, just so we get a little background, let's... let's um, Talk uh, talk a little bit about your um, I don't know let's stay in t let's stay in touch with this let's talk a little about your dark past <laughs> how did this all get started how did this all uh, this this uh, this um, music arc begin for you well it actually started really young because I came from a musical family oh gosh and I'm, I'm actually going back to my childhood which is. Probably not what anyone wants. But <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, please. <laughs> but I came from a very musical family, a lot of kids, seven kids, and was the second to youngest. And so I had four brothers who all had bands ahead of me, and I started playing piano by ear when I was really young. So I'd always been involved in music. I didn't really start taking my own music seriously until much later, though. And... um It wasn't that I hadn't written songs prior to that. I had, and a lot of really bad ones. <laughs> but uh, I didn't really, you know, I just sort of did it, and I didn't really think about it. But the process remains much the same. You know, I, I write when I feel like writing something. I don't generally sit down with an appointment or something. And, yeah, I mean, I have had a family history that's unfortunately common for a lot of people with um, abuse in it, and I uh, went through a period where I started trying to address the abuse, as you usually do feel capable of only later in life, um, because, you know, when you're in it, especially when you're a kid, you just sort of doing whatever you can to get by, yeah. and you sort of are just in that survival mode, and all these survival defenses that help you at the time sort of turn to, you know, to, to, to <laughs> later on, and they, they sort of uh, bite you in the ass later on, the, all the things that kind of help you get by, but 
I had a nervous breakdown, and I spent a number of years um, sort of holed up in my house and secluded. And and um, mm. during that time, I wrote a lot. I hadn't not been writing before that, but during that time, I wrote an awful lot. And at the end of that time, I met a house painter who was at our house, who was my friend John. Um, he's my friend now, but he overheard me playing something inside the house and he had connections to people who had a recording studio and he said, do you have a tape that I can give this, this couple of friends of mine? And he did that and that's what started me recording. Wow. I, they, they said, hey, we'll help you out. And so I have to thank Larry Schaefer and um, John, you know, for for taking those steps to help me. Otherwise, I don't think I ever would have left the house, actually. <laughs> mm. And I still am very close to not leaving the house. Was that way more than you wanted to know? <laughs> no, actually, actually, so, so, so during, which is not an uncommon uh, thing, as you pointed out, but uh, I'm assuming that the music and writing were, were a, uh, um, a form of uh, self-therapy, right? Something to help you. Yeah, they definitely were, and they remain so now. You know, mm. I'm, for right now, I feel like it's very difficult to talk <laughs> to anybody anymore. Uh, there's such a divide, obviously, that's happening amongst Americans. And yes. <laughs> there, are, there are things that, you know, I wish desperately we could talk about. But I've got to say, I've tried and I've sort of come to the conclusion that it's sadly a waste of breath a lot of times right now and but i do think in in works that you make you know whether it's books or music or paintings art whatever theater you can sometimes get a point across to someone who's the polar opposite end of the scale i guess of you through art that you can't in conversation I think people are more permeable, you know, to mm. art and to ideas through art. And so, you know, you have a little, it is therapeutic in that way for me. I, I don't expect to reach everybody, and I'm not into message writing necessarily. I'm just writing what's on my mind. But it is a little comforting to realize that you can sometimes reach people who you couldn't ordinarily reach through through your work. Right, and I think that that is is a thing because normal discourse, of course, uh, these days, wherever you are. I mean, I'm in a uh, you know regular day job myself, and normal discourse becomes uh, difficult in the current climate. And um, it's 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 an amazing turn in a comparative short time to to have leapt this far. You know, so so isn't that awful? I mean, I'm just I don't know about you. It's exhausting. Yeah. It's exhausting. I just feel like I've reached the point. I was talking with my sister the other day, and we've reached the point where, you know, it's like you're, I'm even too tired to get outraged anymore. About yeah. anything. It's like my outrage is so worn out at this point that you just feel sort of like something happens and you go, Ugh, and you flop around like a fish, <laughs> you know full of ennui because you just can't handle which is terrible because that's exactly what I think some people want you know I do think there are yes nefarious people in power where that's that's what they're hoping for they're hoping for everyone to get too tired and worn down and to throw themselves into their distractions and comforts and you know drug use is at an all-time high and yeah. alcoholism in America and it's yeah it's yeah. Uh, I don't want to get that way. No, no, nor do I. I have to tell you that the big argument in in my house with my girlfriend is is uh, is we go through cycles of when we can and can't take the news. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So watching yeah. it or reading it, and so we haven't quite synced up that cycle, unfortunately. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like our tolerances. Oh, yeah, no. have, yeah. We have to get more into some kind of a concentrate on a lunar thing or something. I don't know what we have to concentrate on. <laughs> yeah. But, you have to match your cycles, yes. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's, exactly that's funny. Right. And uh, <laughs> because sometimes I'm like, I have to get out of the room, or she's the same way on another day, and and I'm, uh, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. that's the big source of I, fighting I, in my home. <laughs> oh, I bet it is, and I think it it's probably the same in so many other homes. And yeah, 
just that constant, I don't know. I'm keeping my fingers crossed for the election. Um, yep. Very worried about, I'm very worried about the election meddling and the voter suppression and the gerrymandering and all that, but I'm really, I'm hoping, I, it sounds like a lot more younger people are going to be coming out and voting like millennials and younger. And uh, that makes me feel a little better. And I'm like you with this uh, in terms of um, uh, one of the personality traits you pointed out, your Nor- Norwegian heritage. Expect the worst, mm-hmm. but hope for the best. And uh, yeah, that, I'm trying mm-hmm. to mindset that way, unfortunately. But I think that's what I need to do. You know, everybody's got their own thing. But yeah. 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 Um, anyway. <laughs> um, sorry. Well, don't say sorry. <laughs> this is. Rachel, this is what is on everyone's mind. So we're talking about things that are are you know going on. So and these things all I inform. That, I guess that's. I was going to say. I guess that's why I'm sorry. Everybody's <laughs> probably sick to death of hearing about it. No, not at all. Not at all. As I said, I'm in the, I'm in the right cycle right now, so we can talk about it. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so uh, obviously a lot of this, I mean, your work is, I mean, as, as I'm not telling you anything you haven't heard before in better times, even, uh, in the world, uh, but your, your work is certainly stark and, uh, you know, kind of, kind of, uh, has that, has that tinge of darkness about it. And uh, mm-hmm. did you find that what, when the material that's on this record, was this stuff done, um, well, stay on politics for a second. Was this done post or pre or, or a mix of, um, in terms of writing it, um, a last election? It was both. Okay, so it was, it a, was both. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I it's actually been sitting in the can for a little while, Um you know, in various states, it sat for a while after it was done and it was mixed, and then it sat for a while with mastering, and then I had some technical issues with the very few CDs that I actually made out of it. And so, and I just was sort of girding myself too for the process of putting it out because I'm a giant wimp and it just sort of <laughs> knocks me flat. But uh, yeah, I, I guess more of the songs were probably written, well, yeah, before before 2016, and okay, um, and a lot of, but you know the campaigning was going on for yeah. so long, and a lot of what has what I'm kind of was inspired by locally has been happening for 18 years, you know, 18, 20, going on 20 years now, with just rapid change, particularly in the last five years, happening in, in the Portland area. Mm-hmm. So, um, and in a lot of areas. I know it's, a, it's not just Portland. It's a, People are getting priced out of cities everywhere, and now they're getting priced out of suburbs around those cities everywhere, and now they're getting priced out of the smaller towns on the outside of the suburbs because, yeah, it's, it's this huge thing that's been happening. Yeah, the the whole gentrification and prices shifting, and uh, yeah, that's yeah, which is always an ongoing thing. But the drastic nature of it is is quite a uh, quite a thing. I mean, I live I live in New York City. I live in Queens, actually. I lived in Brooklyn, but could no longer afford to live oh, wow. in Brooklyn. So you know. yeah, I I heard that a lot of people have made that move to Queens. That's right. And now Queens is getting gentrified. Is that true? It is absolutely true. My old neighborhood wow. in Queens before I bought was is a uh, is now priced through the roof because all the people who can't afford the other hipper neighborhoods that we were just discussing. My old neighborhood was only yeah. one train stop from Manhattan, so therefore it's now priced through the roof. Uh-huh. You know? So anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, yeah and it's, well, I've heard it's happening everywhere. There's a there's a blogger in New York. It's called oh, what is this? Do you know the one I'm talking about? It's like Vanishing New York. Do you know oh, that? Oh yeah, blog? of course. Yes, yes, yes. They put out a book, as a matter of fact, a while ago as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of a fan of his. Yeah, me too. That, me too. That's an amazing blog. It's so much change happening there. I can't even. I mean, I think it's happening so fast here, but I know it's even worse. Yeah, in that ha- region. And then you have all the people from New York who can't afford New York started to move out by you. And then they found out that that's going up now, too. So <laughs> I think, though, those, it's still comparatively cheap. You know, 
which blows my mind because, for example, this blue collar neighborhood, I'd always been a southeast girl here. And those are these neighborhoods that were next to the train tracks and a lot of industrial kind of businesses. And um, the houses were under $100,000 up until um, even, gosh, the late 90s. Mm. And then we're still in a pretty affordable range until 2008, 2009, 2010, I'd say. You know, you could get one for around 200000 But they've just, they've, they're all like over a million now. <laughs> and these blue-collar neighborhoods, it's just, they're over, it's $1.2 million and 800000 900000 yeah. These little humble homes that were... You know, homes for people working in the central industrial district and working in the train yard, and it just blows the mind. I, I I never thought I'd see this. I never predicted this happening in Portland, and I guess that's not very far-seeing of me, but it's crazy. So we are talking to uh, Rachel uh, Taylor Brown about real estate prices and uh, all kinds of things here. <laughs> and, uh, I can tell you the. I can tell you the real estate prices probably of any home in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. <laughs> well, you're all go- you'll be our go-to person when we're coming out uh, out west. Um, I will so- <laughs> find you. I'll find you a home, Ben. Well, thanks, Rachel. <laughs> um, so, so, um, so now you're originally from. Where were you originally from? I'm from Portland. I mean, oh, I'm, I'm I from Oregon. You- I'm from. Yeah, I was born in Portland, and I'm I'm. Grew up in Boring. Do you know Boring? No. Is it Boring? It's, well, yeah, I guess it kind of was. I didn't <laughs> think of it as, I'm, I'm not a bored person. I've never been bored particularly, and there was always plenty. Well, we would walk the train tracks, for example, into the seldom used train tracks into Boring. It was a mile or so from our house, and then we go buy candy at McCall's Country Store. <laughs> and okay. we bring it back along the train tracks. So, that was part of the fun. <laughs> and that store is still there. They sell, like, um, Jesus hats with guns on them. Oh, and, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and fart bombs. Do you, did you ever see fart bombs? Of course. Like these little packets. Yes, they sell fart bombs. Very and they useful. Sell, very useful. Yeah, that's right. They sell Chico sticks and Necco wafers and, yeah. Ah, the Necco wafers. They're horrible. Who likes Necco wafers? I don't know. People used to buy them, though, when I was a kid, too. And uh, my friends would say, you want one? And you'd say, yes. And then you'd have it. you no. like, why did I say yes? You know? But yes. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like it's like some terrible powder-coated host. You know? I mean, <laughs> yeah, there's some kind, of, like, some kind of biblical quality to them, because you do suffer. So it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> Necco wafers, Aye. the cursed host. See, now you should be you should be uh, writing a song about Necco wafers, and people would think you're being oh. light, but you're actually singing about pain. So you know, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, well, I even put I'm it inspired. in your head. <laughs> Now I'm inspired, Uh-oh. and I'll dedicate it to you. Oh, gee, thank you. Um, so, so, <laughs> so one of the one of the gorgeous things about this album and all of your albums, but this one particularly, is the the recording is just like so so rich and dynamic and and so beautiful, and that's even on the the um, you know the. Um, "Quote unquote harder sounding songs like Getcher and things like that, but the the piano is just like it's the warmest, most dynamic Aww. sound, and and I'm sure that has you know 99 percent to do with your with your playing, but also the production on the thing is no, just no. beautiful. It has it, it has nothing to do with me, and it has everything <laughs> to do with Jeff Jeff Stewart Saltzman, who I record with, right. and entirely. I mean his. His ear and his approach to, he's kind of old school, you know, he trained actually and worked in, in when studios were thriving, sure. he worked in recording studios with um, learning from some of the best people. He actually came from uh, the San Jose area in California, San Francisco 
ish, and he moved up to Portland, but he worked for several years in one of the big studios in that, that area. And he just knows so many things, and he has very, very strong tastes and ideas about things and is not, uh, like me, is not into the heavy compression kind of thing, which is kind of difficult with playing my songs on the radio, I realize, because they're not, you know, they're not, they're just not mixed and mastered in the same way that most albums are now. Um, Mm -hmm. I like dynamic range and I tend to write things and Jeff knows that I write things with a lot of dynamic range and I like to hear things go from loud to quiet. I don't want it all evened out and made uniform and standard and compressed like crazy. So, um, I will tell him that you said that because I know he'll love he'll love hearing that. But I I just I feel so lucky to get to record with him hmm. and get the benefit of that that experience and of his taste. He's just got he's got great taste. He's got a great ear and he he's got super deep knowledge to to achieve that sound that you liked. Yeah, so that's much. that. It's that whole, for saying that. Yeah, it's that whole breathable that whole breathing really. That the music breathes mm-hmm. and it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, oh, good. Yeah. So what's what when now you're you're playing? Are, are these the same guys you've normally worked with? The guys who are you're playing with in the band formats? With a couple exceptions, yeah. Um, I've I'm not performing out that much lately. I mean, I, I'm good for a album release show when I put out a <laughs> an album, but then otherwise I'm usually doing little solo things, maybe a duo thing with my friend Ben, who's been my fellow band member and good friend for many years. Um, he plays viola. He, he can actually sing and play anything. He's kind of crazy that way. But uh, the band, yeah, I, I brought in, I didn't have a drummer my drummer had moved and so oh. i brought in a couple of drummers and mark powers um played on most of the songs and i heard about him through several people and he plays um with several bands in the area and then joe mangus who plays on air apparent which is one of the last songs um came in and just uh, knocked it out of the park. It's a song that was difficult because I wanted it to be very spare, but at the same time, I wanted the drums to be big and sound big, you know, and Mm. he did a great job with that. And Joe's touring with the Eels now, or with Mm. Eels. I don't know if there's a the in front of it. And, yeah, and Justin, um, who is playing with, Block Party and who was with Menomina is a friend of Jeff's Mm -hmm. who had played on a previous album of mine and I met him kind of during that process where we were crossing paths going to Jeff's house to record different things and he just happened to be around when we were doing Gitcher and that bass part and the sax part that's Justin Harris Um, he he said oh yeah I'll do this and so he, he hung out and he recorded those and he was uh he's not in my band, but it was the second time he'd guessed it on something. And then the Newmans, yeah, who play the horns and stuff. Right. They've they've played on four or five of my albums, I think. How so, cool, how cool and a lot though of the to singers. have Yeah, how cool to have a little uh, core group of people that you uh, keep coming back to. I think that's nice. Oh, I do too. And I don't deserve it. But <laughs> they're they're great. <laughs> um <laughs> So, so I, did, I didn't mention Jeff, Jeff Langston is one of the people I most don't deserve. Who's my bass player, who is wonderful. <laughs> and he's just, besides being a great talented player, he's, they're all so supportive. Lee, who's also a songwriter who plays guitar, Lee Marble and Ben Lansford. And I mean, my sister Katie joins me to sing and we've sung together forever. So it's, it's helpful to have. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's really great to have such good people to work with and and behind me and with me yeah and 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 when you when you go into record do you record a bunch of things at once or you do like one at a time or what do you do yeah the actual recording of the songs was pretty quick i mean jeff and i i'm pretty quick i work pretty quickly when i record and the singing stuff is probably my favorite part and the easiest part but 
Yeah, the actual recording itself, which was done whenever we had time, kind of, between us and our schedules, did not actually take that long. And then you just have to get people in. It was all recorded in, in Jeff's basement, which is, you know, just this residential area um, behind a nursing home. Uh, and we just set the drums up upstairs and sometimes throw singers upstairs. The trombones were recorded upstairs and he just had cables that he snaked downstairs and the rest of it, he had, he had his piano downstairs, that nice warm sounding piano and this little, very nice room for doing vocals. And we just, yeah, I did some of the vocals, I think just sitting next to him in the, next to the control board, you know? Oh, wow. The computer. That's nice. They were just, they were, Roughs, I think we kept roughs on a couple things, but it's also it's also more of an intimate thing. You're not like isolated in the booth kind of a deal, and yeah, that's kind of nice. No, that's that's huge for me. I'm not very comfortable around. It takes me a lot to get really comfortable around people and trust them. And I've worked with Jeff, and we've been good friends for so long that. I have that comfort level where I don't worry about anything. I do. I feel pretty free to do anything hmm. around him, which is exactly what you want when you're recording. You want to be able to seize those serendipitous moments and ideas, and not feel stifled or like you're or like you're too nervous or worried about someone's opinion or something. Yeah, you know, I know he'll give me his opinion. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's super opinionated, just like I am, and I rely on it, but. But I trust his opinion, yeah. and I trust him, and so I feel comfortable enough to get a more intimate, intimate performance, I think, when I want it, you know, and I do. I, You know, when we recorded, he wanted me to record the piano and vocals together on a lot of those quiet songs, on all of the quiet songs, actually. Mm -hmm. So he just set up a, two mics, you know, or more than two mics for the piano, but he just, we recorded the vocal and the piano together, and I don't even remember just being there you know i was able to still go into my little hole in my own private space in recording for example god or 17 years cicada and i really lost track of him i didn't have to think that's how comfortable i can i can be with him yeah, that's like that's a very magic thing that's nice yeah it is i feel lucky yeah so so now you're playing you're playing here and there, out there, are you are you coming mm -hmm. to New York at any time? Oh gosh, I would love to. I would love to, and yeah. I actually had a friend. Do you know Greta Gertler Gold? Of course, you do. I know of. Well, she and she had a band called the Universal Thump, but right, I think thump, she just performs right. under. Yeah, and Adam gold is that right is her husband oh you feel i don't know I, just, I, I know her through mutual acquaintances that's how we know each other so well, she's great she's a great songwriter but she invited me to do a gig out there with her well that i was planning on being in that area and i thought it would work out and it turned out i couldn't do it i think it was actually my name was up there and it was scheduled and everything it was <sighs> at a place that starts with b it was in brooklyn and it was a a place that started with B. Now, a Do you know what I'm talking about? No. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like a pretty great venue, but uh, I've got some people, and I have other friends out there that have invited me out, and you know, who'll say, "We'll do a show together when you get out here." So I just have to get out there. Was it the Bell House? No. Okay. I think it was a, a name, and it was maybe Frenchy sounding or, or I don't know. Barbe Barbez. Yeah, That'd that be, was it. That would be a wonderful place for you to play. Yeah, that was it. That yeah, was it. There you go. Yeah. Well, Very good. Nice. That's good to hear. Yeah, so do it. <laughs> and and you ha you have to come to New York to play and uh, solo or with a you know a band or whatever you want to bring. But it, it'll be it'll be a show a lot of us will be looking forward to. So it should be great. Did the, oh, thank you. Oh, definitely. Uh, did the so the album is now officially released? Like what? Last week, I think. Yes, last Friday. Okay, and and what's what? What kind of critical response are you getting um, from it so far? 
Well, knock on wood, it's been it's been very nice. <laughs> I've had I've you know, like I said, I kind of gird my loins <laughs> if I see someone's written about something, and I know some reviews are still yet to come because you know it just came out, but. Right. Um, it's, it's been, I can't complain. I've, I've gotten some nice, nice feedback for it. So, so far, so good. That's fantastic. So after, after now this is done, do you, are you a person who like writes all the time? Like whenever you, whenever it comes to you or do, I know you said you, mm-hmm. you, uh, you know, you don't like set time and things like that, but do you get in a, it's time for me to be writing an album or some songs mode or does it just happen whenever it happens? Oh, completely disorganized. It just happens whenever it happens. And okay. then I do kind of start playing songs that I start, I, they'll, they'll kind of bunch themselves or sequence themselves when I'm just practicing them or playing through them. And so sequencing is usually pretty easy for me when I get to an album <laughs> because I've already been playing them in a certain order and I like their transitions and so I want to keep them. And so I guess and they're sort of clumping themselves like that, the album just sort of makes itself that way for me every time. I'll recognize, you know, I'll maybe go, oh, I need another song, and then I'll grab something that isn't in my clump. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But um, mostly it just really happens sort of naturally that way for me. I don't have to do a lot of, a lot of deciding. It feels like it sort of comes together naturally. Mm. Okay, so they kind of in the way in the way that you have written them is tends to be the way they wind up on the record. Yeah, well, not necessarily in the order, but in the groups. I'll just start. I'll just start playing when I start playing through songs just for my own enjoyment at the piano, or if I'm working out a part or something. I'll recognize. I'll, I'll just launch into another. It's like I'll finish working on one, or I finish playing one, and I'll just launch into another one because I feel like it. And then I realized, ooh, I feel like it because I really like the transition of that key to that key, or, or I like this transition of, hmm. you know, and then when you put together the album, actually, it does change because you don't want too many slow ones together and too many fast ones or whatever. You have to add some, you have to tweak things a little bit. But no, surprisingly, like the beginning of that album, that, that of the new album is, I, I didn't really mess with that. That just was how those that's just how those work to me. That's just, that's the order those songs were in. Mm-hmm. And then when you get to maybe around the fifth or sixth song, I had to think a little more about, okay, what do I want to put here? Hmm. Very interesting, because it then becomes a very organic experience for you, and that's great. Yeah, it is. It's, it's uh, yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so the album is out now, and um, what about the title of the album? Uh, how'd, we come, how'd we come by that? I don't really remember. I just <laughs> had jotted I had jotted down a lot of things, and a lot of what's happening in the world. I think I had said something to my husband and my sister just with the various catastrophes and events that were happening. I think I just had said, run, tiny human, and the whole thing, the subjects that I'm writing about, it's a good umbrella title for, and I just liked it. I liked I liked the short and sweetness of it and the fact that it just was sort of comprehensive and kind of, kind of funny. Yeah, and, 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 and the, uh, the, uh, the cover imagery is also... Uh, Kind of uh, almost almost happy looking until you look closely. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You're talking about the arrows poking the and little. That would be the arrows. Yes, being, yes. The arrows being shot into the beautiful wooden creature. Yes. <laughs> is, the, a, is, the, a, is the beautiful woodland creature going to escape those arrows? Therein lies the question. Mm, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> in keeping with your songwriting style perfect <laughs> yeah what do you think <laughs> listen I'm, I'm i as 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 you said earlier we 
prepare for the worst, but hope for the best, you know? What could I tell you? Um, yeah. <laughs> Richard Taylor Brown, it's been so great to talk to you. Um, Run Tiny Human, the, the brand new one, absolutely fantastic, beautiful. We are talking about the breathing in it and the, uh, the uh, dynamics in it. It's a beautiful album oh. to hear. And and Thank uh, you. you've done a beautiful job, and um, your band is great. Your production is great. I don't know what else to say except uh, get your butt to New York. That's what I have to say. Thank you. So I will. Thanks Thank for, you so much. And this this interview, of course, everyone there listening right now, will be on our archive through next Tuesday, and then thereafter it'll be up on YouTube. You just have to search, of oh. course, to uh, Finn's Revolution page. And uh, you'll see it up there uh, and be able to listen to it at your leisure. But it'll be on the archive at WUSB.FM uh, starting at 8 o'clock tonight through next week. And, Thank you so much. And, uh, Rachel, thanks so much for joining us and spending the time with us. And best of luck with everything, and we'll see you soon. All right. Thank you so much, Ben. Thanks. Bye. What can you give?